Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. I think we are ready to start. Thank you very much for joining us this late in the afternoon uh, on the second day of the Internet Governance Forum. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Mira Milosevic. I am the Executive Director of the Global Forum for Media Development. Uh, we represent a network of 200 civil society organizations from 70 countries. We all support media freedom, journalism, and media development worldwide. Given the role that internet uh, plays in producing, distributing content, as well as interacting with audiences and citizens worldwide, the future, overall sustainability, and even the existence of professional journalism and news media are now directly linked to the way different layers of internet are regulated and managed. So far, this hasn't been sufficiently recognized by many in this complex internet governance universe. Journalism and news media voices, together with some representatives from the civil society, are some of the most absent actors from these policy spaces, up until now. Even we are uh, all meant to be inclusive and multi-stakeholder. Uh, even in this Internet Governance Forum over the last two days, we have seen many panels that address the issue of misinformation and disinformation without hearing those who produce quality, reliable, professional information that we now know is the best antidote to misinformation and disinformation. Furthermore, we have heard that we still lack a more holistic approach to digital policy, one that isn't confined to traditional layers of internet or different departments within governments or different teams in private companies. We need the approach that considers where all these sectors and layers intersect, as we have heard in, for instance, the previous session, such as interplay between protecting human rights, setting technical standards, and digital market regulation. And we really urgently need a recognition that internet actors and policymakers in the age of digital conver convergence are indeed shaping the future of our public information spaces, including journalism, news media, other content producers, and ultimately shaping the future of our democracies. To make a real difference, policymakers, we feel, need to move beyond what one of the speakers here called whack-a-mole approach and tendency to address the issues facing our information spaces and democracies through fragmented and piecemeal steps. Global Forum for Media Development has prioritized engaging in this space since 2017 and with many of our members and partners who are represented here today. A big thanks goes to all of you who have worked hard together with us to create a formal space for our community to be engaged within the Internet Governance Forum. We are tremendously proud to be your partner and launch today a dynamic coalition on sustainability of journalism and news media. Over the next years, we expect this dynamic coalition to be looking to contribute to policy and regulatory debates by providing research, input and advice and work together with all of you and other stakeholders to help create an environment where independent professional journalism, media, and other credible content producers can survive and thrive. It is with great pleasure also that I can introduce you to our four speakers today. Hossein Derkashan is an Iranian-Canadian author and media researcher, as well as pioneer of blogging, podcasts, and tech journalism in Iran, over which he spent six years in prison until 2014. Now based at the London School of Economics and Political Sciences in London, he spent uh, also two years, uh, uh, actually two research fellowships in 2018 at the Harvard Kennedy School and MIT Media Lab. More, more recently, he is the author of a report on misinformation and disinformation commissioned by Council of Europe. Welcome, Hussein. We also have uh, Dr. Courtney Raj, Advocacy Director at the Committee to Protect Journalists, where she leads the organization's internet governance and tech policy work. 
She is the author of Cyber Activism and Citizen Journalism in Egypt, Digital Dissidence and Political Change, and holds a PhD in International Relations. She is also an adjunct professor in international communications at American University and a non-resident fellow at Center for Media Data and Society at the CEU. We have also uh, here Michael Ryszek Wozniak, uh, who is the head of infrastructure and information security at OCCRP. Um, Organized Crime Corruption Reporting Project, one of the major investigative journalism uh, networks. He comes from a tech policy and activism background, and before joining OCCRP, he has worked in the digital hum human rights area. His main policy interests include information security, privacy in digital age, internet governance, copyright reform, digital media literacy. Shang Hyung Hu is program specialist at UNESCO's Freedom of Expression and Media Development uh, Division. Her main responsibilities are in the areas of freedom of expression, online and offline, internet privacy, media development, and internet governance. She is managing uh, UNESCO's ongoing project on defending internet universality indicators, and we could hear more about uh, indicators uh, on day zero in their session about it. Uh, we will first hear Hussein, and then we'll proceed with interactive discussion, so feel free to raise your hand if you have a specific question related to one of the interventions from our speakers. We will also have 30 minutes for further comments and questions at the end of this session. And please keep your questions, of course, short to the point. And if you have any comments, please keep to one minute. Hossein, welcome to this, uh, um, our first uh, DC session. And um, you have uh, uh, recently, uh, in one of your articles, asked a highly relevant question. In, if professional journalism cannot survive and thrive in the digital age, who will safeguard democracy? So let's hear your thoughts on what happened to journalism and why do you think it needs to survive for our democracies to exist? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and thanks everybody for not sleeping now <laughs> after lunch. Um, actually, I, I think they should have had some uh, bean bags out there for people to be having short power naps, like the Japanese style. But it's not trendy yet, maybe in a few years. So my presentation is about journalism and democracy. But before we get into that, I would have to um, present my argument about why I'm saying that um, we have to talk about something which I call post-news journalism. Because journalism is different from news. News has been the main output of journalism, and the crisis is about news, not journalism. So I'll explain exactly how and present my argument. Um, you can also find me on Twitter with the same name if you look for me, and my email is there. So, um, briefly about my story, my very dramatic story. Uh, I started the blogging um, quote-unquote revolution, that's what the, it was called at the time in, uh, from Canada. This is the English version of my blog. I had the per, a, per, a separate Persian one, which was much more popular than this one. Um, so they started calling it a revolution because it sort of democratized writing for this first time in Iran and many other contexts and countries. Um, so then they also gave me this title. I was very young, as you could see, and thin, <laughs> and lots of hair. And then I suddenly disappeared. In 2008, when I went back to Iran, I, I disappeared. Obviously, I knew where I was, but nobody else knew where I was. Um, I was arrested uh, after two weeks at my parents' house, and I, kept, I was kept in solitary confinement for eight months, obviously without the internet which was very difficult, but, but also without anything to read or write. Interrogation was my only fun. Um, so then I was given 20 years of sentence, um, which was really absurd. And eventually, after six years, they realized how absurd it was. So I was pardoned after six years. Um, when I came out, I realized that everything was cha had changed. 
on the internet. And I wrote this essay, The Web We Have to Save, about how the di rich, diverse, and free, and decentralized web that we all loved is turning into something else. And I tried to theorize it using or focusing on the idea of hyperlinks. The reason we are observing a shift on the internet is because we've um, suppressed the hyperlinks. I mean, not we, social media platforms, for economic reasons, obviously. So we've, changed, we've moved from uh, books internet to something I called TV internet. And these are the, the signs. These are the, the dimensions of these two very two different eras or very, very two different discourses. Um, but the most important among these are how it was encouraging reason and now how it, it's encouraging emotion. So just think about like buttons. Imagine if they were agree buttons or trust buttons. The way you, they, they ask you to, to interact with them is very emotional, and this is very different from the previous generation of, of web applications where you were only supposed to leave comments, which was a rational act, generally speaking. Not always, but... So it's turned from a, a place for exposition into a place for entertainment. It's lost so much of its, some of its diversity in a way, um, but then it's also lost the non-linearity that hyperlinks provided into a very linear stream, uh, endless stream of images that is very similar to television. Even, I mean, look at Instagram, to YouTube, even, even though Instagram is not like YouTube where you would automatically um, see different videos back to back, but the way you <coughs> swipe down, it's very much like turning a television, and it's endless. It's an endless flow of television. It's centralized, it's passive, inward-looking, and it's based on habits, and it gives you comfort because it doesn't challenge you as much because of the algorithms who learn what you want and they feed you based on that. Three other aspects which are really fascinating is how product placement and commercials, which were the very traditional models of TV business models, are now very common on the new social media platforms, especially on the more visual ones. Also the idea of prime time, if you're familiar, if you tweet something now, nobody sees it. You have to wait until 7, 8 p.m., like, or even 9, very much like television, uh, prime time. And also the celebrities are becoming the same, you know. And previously, before my prison, celebrities on the web were di very different. Now they're the same. Music and, and uh, cinema and TV celebrities are all the same. So it, I think it would get us some, to somehow back to the arguments of how television is, um, is reducing public discourse. And I think everybody should read New Postman's book again on uh, its damage to public discourse. Because he wrote it in 1985 at the rise of television, at the height of the popularity and dominance of television, which was challenged by the internet for almost 30 years, and now television is back and recaptured the space that it had lost in the form of social media. This is an amazing quote from him. Americans no longer, it's not just Americans obviously now, everybody, no longer talk to each other, they entertain each other. They do not exchange ideas, they exchange images. So we've moved on from this picture to something that we all see every day. Obviously, this is also as much a, hist a story about um, newspapers as much as it is about hats for men. <laughs> and they almost appear, disappeared for, I mean, very similar reasons they disappeared. Hats disappeared because with automobiles, mm, there wasn't that much space for a hat. And you didn't need them because the automobiles were protecting people from the sun and rain. Um, the same almost happened to newspapers. So journalism is in crisis. Everyone knows that. These are the aspects. The circulation, you could see what a disastrous um, evolution it has faced. It includes digital and print. And remember, 1980, uh, 1941 was in the middle of the Second World War. Um, this is the workforce. This is also shocking. And obviously, from 2017 until now, it's got even worse. And then the revenues. 
in the richest country, in, in, in the most uh, economically viable um, environment for journalism in the US. So is it about business models, ethics, or quality, the crisis of journalism? I would say none, because the, the, the dominant debate is either about business models, quality, or ethics. I argue that it's lost its cultural relevance. News has lost its cultural relevance, and thus nobody wants to pay for it. The reasons and the argument that I'm, uh, I'm presenting and I'm making is inspired by James Kerry, a media scholar, an amazing, really creative me media scholar, who looks at communication as culture. This is his book. I encourage everybody to take a look. He looks at communication as culture and ritual. What is it? It means it's a obviously symbolic process where reality is produced, maintained, repaired, and transformed. But it also has different aspects. One aspect or function of news has been drama. Uh, there are three, basically. So the first one is drama. And James Carey's idea about communication as a ritual instead of as a transmission of messages is very helpful in, um, in realizing, um, in explaining this aspect of news. So news is not just information, but drama. It not only describes, it doesn't describe the world, but portrays an arena of dramatic focus and action. News has also functioned as a mechanism of nowness, in a way, you know, to live in the present moment. Um, it, so it provided a desire to do away from the epic, heroic, and traditional in favor of the unique, original, novel, and new, or news. It also has had the global aspect, a global experience. This has also been challenged now, because when it emerged in, in the 18th century, news was a historic reality. It's a form of culture invented by a particular class at a particular point of history. It wasn't a universal thing that could happen anywhere, anytime. In this case, by the middle class, largely in the 18th century. So my argument, which I laid out um, in more detail in this piece in The Guardian, and also a similar piece in, on Medium, is that news, in, in all these three aspects, news is being challenged by other things. It's, it hasn't lost these aspects or these functions, obviously, but it's being challenged by other things. So in terms of drama, we have computer games, we have documentaries and films and Twitter itself and even some of the news channels which are more about drama and entertainment than news. I mean, I think all cable news are like that. And if you want to know more about why news, is, news channels are, are so dramatic and entertaining, you should um, look into John Fisk's um, work. Also as a globalized experience, news has been challenged by cheap travel, Instagram and YouTube as examples because now people can travel and see things directly themselves or see through social media. But also we've, we've seen a shift from the, low, from the global to the local, the rise of identity politics, race, um, racial consciousness, which is the positive aspect, but then there are also negative aspects of the rise of religions and, and racism and, and um, and ethnicities and, and nationalism and all that. But also you see that the rise of artisan products, that's also related to the shift from the global to the, to the local. Somehow it also can, it can also be argued that this is the beginning of, or maybe the end of globalization in a way, in some, in some aspects, culturally at least. And then the local news um, is not about um, municipal municipality and local politics anymore. It's actually what F Facebook is feeding you. It's updates about friends and family and celebrities because they are our cousins that we don't see anymore. So news as nowness. This has also been challenged by mobile phones because if you had to watch the news bulletin at a certain time, or buy a newspaper that said, Sam, now that's been challenged. So the nowness is much better provided by mobile phones and, and tweets and alerts and all that. So if Telegraph made detached time from the production of news, 
mobile phones have detached the distribution of news from time. You could receive anything, anytime, anywhere. So events are reaching the public directly now. And this is, uh, has been a huge challenge to, to journalism uh, organizations. So this is the reality now. No hats, more women, um, obviously, and mm, phones instead of newspapers. And also, I think, I don't think they're reading news, to be honest. So this is the end of news as, with this definition, the, this specific kind of uh, newspaper output, which was the main output of the of the of journalism, but is it the end of journalism? Not really. But we have to in reinvent journalism. I would suggest. I mean, why? Obviously, because, as James Carey says in this book, uh, in another book, he says journalism is democracy. He doesn't say it helps democracy. He says it is democracy because, and democracy is journalism because they are both about, or they are public conversation, and we need obviously this, and um, so it's not a coincidence that we see a decline in democracy and journalism at the same time around the world, because they are the same thing in Kerry's view. Um, so, the future of journalism then would be something about, which I call effective narratives instead of news. This, this, if this is the only type of output that is doing economically well and it's reaching millions, hundreds of millions of people, or drama, briefly. So this is where art meets journalism, especially when it's about long-form narratives in text, audio, and video. So think about literature and journalism. Nonfiction books are doing very well. Think about cinema and journalism, think about the documentary films and the success, the financial success and other aspects of popularity, narrative podcasts, films. These are the documentaries that you might have seen. This is a, you might have also heard this podcast. And even the Daily has, uh, has a very uh, documentary sort of structure now if you compare it to the early episodes. Or even films based on the reality, on, on facts and reporting, this one for example. Or this other old one about the FBI. Then painting and journalism. We have to skip other forms, theater and journalism. But then there are things that could be done, music journalism, dance journalism, dance music, theater journalism, or opera. This one is actually being done. This is an opera called Nixon in China, which is, I haven't seen it, but it sounds very interesting. So journalism, if journalism and democracy are the same thing, we, we, cannot, we cannot afford um, allowing journalism to, to die if its main output, which was the news, has died, or is dying. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hussain, for, for this uh, refreshing and different uh, approach to why journalism matters for democracy and vice versa. Uh, I will ask you later some questions about uh, your other ideas um, of ways in, in which uh, we could provide spaces in the digital for journalism and uh, uh, media and uh, co other content providers. But now to you, Courtney. Um, so we heard why journalism needs why the democracy needs journalism and then why journalism needs democracy. Uh, why uh, do we need a discussion of sustainability of journalism and news media here at the Internet Governance Forum? Why is this discussion relevant here and now? And what are the current trends that you're seeing in moderating, managing, and regulating content that has implication for journalism and news media sustainability from the perspectives that are discussed here at the Internet Governance Forum? Thank you. So very interesting but very challenging not to respond from um, the kind of academic perspective, but I think that we would do well to think about journalism as distinct from other forms of cultural representation or content production. 
And we are careful, um, I'm with the Committee to Protect Journalists, to talk about journalism versus content. Those are not the same things. Journalism is a particular form of communication that is realist as opposed to fictional. It aspires to the ideals of the journalistic field a la Bourdieu, such as truthfulness, credibility, verifiability, and the public interest. But maybe that's a debate for another time. Going back to why are we talking about the sustainability of journalism and news media at the Internet Governance Forum, um, I think that it's very clear from the description of um, how the mechanisms by which we get our news and journalism have shifted um, over the time period that that is one major reason why. Um, back in 2014, we hosted a session called the Press Freedom Dimensions of Internet Governance because we were seeing that so many of the decisions being made about the platforms um, on which we do journalism in terms of the reporting as well as the dissemination and production of journalism um, intersected with issues around intergovernance, internet governance from the legal structures to um, the platform revenues. And I think that we have to think about some of the most important impacts of this digital convergence of journalism and its effect on media visibility, sustainability, viability, um, and as well as the, the people who produce journalists, journalism who we usually call journalists. Um, so first, this is an internet governance issue because there is a significant relationship to the platforms. So first, if we think about platform design, um, the fact that there are a couple of very large, very important platforms means that if you are a journalist, if you are producing journalism and trying to get to the audience, you need to go where your audience is. And so that means you are going to be on Facebook, Twitter, um, YouTube, uh, increasingly WhatsApp, which of course is owned by Facebook, and Facebook. And so the designs of these platforms are going to affect how how you do journalism. It's going to affect how you produce stories, what stories you produce, how they get disseminated, um, how you're able to earn revenue or not earn revenue, um, what, are, what the logic of journalism is completely impacted by the platforms and their platform design, which impacts on the economic viability of news media, the economic viability of producing journalism. Um, one of the things that distinguishes journalism from other types of communication is that it, it can cost money. Investigative journalism, for example, costs money. We're going to hear from OCCRP, the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, which did the Paradise Papers. That was not a cheap enterprise. Um, it also has to do with economic viability in terms of advertising and revenue. So we've seen the economic bottom completely taken out of the news media. So as we think about how um, you know, the internet and its platforms are governed, for example, um, in the previous session on platform responsibility, I'm looking at taxation issues that has a direct relevance to the journalistic uh, endeavor. It's, it imposes business costs and can become very risky because of algorithmic choices and terms of service that rule these platforms and um, the mechanisms by which the news media and journalism are able to um, reach their communities. Furthermore, the asymmetry and lack of transparency on many of these platforms and even on how um, you know, the, the internet even outside of platforms, for example, um, ISPs and ownership models around there, net neutrality issues and how that impacts on the ability of news media or journalism to reach its audiences. Choices around, for example, free basics and what platforms are allowed on there. So these issues, uh, have a relationship to the sustainability of news media. And of course, if we think about serving and building community, this has a lot to do with the platforms that it happens on. Now, we also get to the idea that you know, data is the new oil or the new gold, whatever your, um, your you know, issue du jour is. But basically, if data is the engine of growth and the internet has created an, say we accept the idea that surveillance capitalism is one of the dominant logics of the modern era, then news media also have um, ethical and practical challenges around how they will use data and how they will compete in a surveillance capitalist system. 
Then we go to things like combating disinformation. So as we hear policymakers, you know, how, I don't even know how many sessions I probably should have counted before getting here um, at this Internet Governance Forum, not to mention so many other fora where the governance of the Internet is discussed, has to do with disinformation, and yet you rarely hear about the role of journalism in combating that. Um, so, you know, as a, a colleague Dragna pointed out earlier, um, the, you know, the this asymmetry, for example, between government actors or between very wealthy actors who are able to buy botnets, who are able to buy social media manipulation, um, whether these are elected leaders, as in uh, the United States, as in Brazil, as in India, um, or whether you, you know, create armies, as in China and Iran, um, to manipulate social media, how are journalists supposed to compete in this um, information environment. And then you have things like the safety of journalism and this actual and the safety of journalists, which actually has to do with sustainability, and you're going to hear more about that a little bit from the digital security side from, from my colleague from OCCRP. If we look at the number of journalists who have been imprisoned around the world, it's again directly related to internet governance. So you have countries that are coming up with legislative frameworks that criminalize false news, that create cybercrime bills that also lead to journalists getting imprisoned, more than half of the 1,100 journalists imprisoned since the first Internet Governance Forum, 577 were internet journalists specifically. So this has a direct relationship. If you're spending money trying to get your journalists out of prison, um, trying to figure out how to combat criminal defamation laws online, you're not spending that on doing the news. Mata Musser is a perfect example. An, one of the only remaining independent news organizations in Egypt um, where several of its reporters were arrested over the weekend. Its office is raided by Egyptian security forces. And you know they're now spending money trying to counteract the censorship of their website, get their people out of jail, instead of doing journalism, which is very important in this closed society. Can I jump in here just to, to ask you, what do you see as other trends in uh, uh, policy and regulation of content online that are impacting directly journalism and news media? Sure. So content moderation has become an enormous issue for journalism and for the journalism support industry and the press freedom community. So um, the impact of algorithmic choices by um, the platforms, as well as policy choices by governments, so for example, um, efforts at countering violent extremism, have had an impact on journalism. Why? Because we see that journalism is being caught up in these efforts to filter or counteract uh, extremism online. For example, citizen journalism from Syria, which is very costly, not only in, times of, in terms of money, but in terms of lives. It is one of the most dangerous and deadly places to be a journalist. And yet these journalists who have put their lives on the line to bring the world news from the front lines of one of the most important conflicts of our era have their uh, content taken off of line, offline because it either gets caught in pre-content upload filters or because it's labeled as terrorist content or because the platforms don't have enough Arabic speakers to understand what the content is about. Um, so, so that's one aspect is content removals. On a regular basis, we are reached out to by journalists who have their accounts closed or their content removed and need help um, getting that information back up. And usually these are the journalists who are providing a counter narrative um, to uh, terrorist groups or a counter narrative to corrupt government officials. Um, so it's very important that you have that information online and so again it's it goes to resources it goes to time and sustainability of journalism any time that you're not spending doing journalism that you're spending trying to get your content back up trying to figure out how to deal with the latest terms of service trying to figure out how to evade algorithmic you know, sh shifts on the platforms or how to not, not have your policymakers implement new legislation that increasingly criminalizes some of these issues online and imposes even more um, harsh restrictions and punishments for online speech. Thank you very much, Courtney. Uh, there was a perfect segue um, uh, to introduce uh, Arisha here. Um, as a counter narrative to corrupt officials and organized crime. Uh, we, we are seeing, of, car, of course, uh, a disruption of the business model. And where the market is particularly failing, uh, as we see it, is uh, local reporting, international affairs, but particularly uh, investigative journalism. 
And uh, we have heard that international organized crime and corruption and money laundering cases in many, uh, um, in many cases are investigated based on investigative reporting, especially on international level. Uh, we were also told uh, uh, from your colleagues that one story, even in developing country, uh, costs at least uh, 30,000 or 40,000 euros, uh, and uh, very often into, into six figures. What are uh, the sources of funding uh, at the moment for investigative journalism organizations, especially those that operate uh, as international networks, uh, as OCCRP does? Hello. Um, so one, one disclaimer, I am not on the business side, I'm not on the journalistic side, I'm on the tech side of OCCRP, however, I hope I can answer uh, some of those questions. Um, let me give you a little bit of context. When we're, when, we're talking about investig when we're talking about an investigative journalism story or a project, we're talking about something that was going on for one year, two years, sometimes three years. We've had projects that were running for six years before we were able to publish, before we were able to get the last document proving the last connection between the last two peoples or, or the, the last two companies, right? So these are very long-running projects. These take immense amounts of, of uh, resources. Uh, the 30,000, 40,000 um, euros or dollars number is um, some is, is a number, but of course many of those many of those investigations will cost many many times more. Um, so the sources of funding that's that's obviously a huge issue because of course uh, we could run ads at OCCRP.org, right? But then we're running into the privacy issues of tracking our, our, our readership and, and, um, and all the problems with, uh, with what if we have to write about the people who's, who are buying the ads on our website, right? Um, many of our member centers are, uh, are relying on crowdfunding and this tends to work well for some. Uh, especially in places like Serbia, where where the uh, where our member centres are are one of the very few uh, independent uh, journalistic outlets, um, so the population is interested in actually keeping them alive. But this is a very precarious position where somebody might just decide, you know, the, the population might might at some point decide that there are more important things to fund, or or the economic downturn will cause people not to be able to. Uh, to donate. Um, obviously, there are um, a lot of journalistic organizations, and th this includes OCCRP, are funded by grants. And this is also complicated. This is also a, a, a um, difficult position to be in because, again, what if we have to write about our donors, right? Or, or what if we have to, um, like, donors, do donors always. Even if they try not to interfere, they, they, there's always some kind of a maybe not pressure, but but suggestion or or something like that. You're, you're always beholden to your to your donors, and additionally, when you're when you're running on on um, grants, that means that very often you're running on projects, right? You're you're running your organization from a project to a project. You're beholden to those projects. You're limited to the projects that you've you've been able to fund, and very often you don't have funding for more general things like um, like administration or tech support or, or, or information security. Speaking about tech support, we have heard from uh, Dragana in the previous session and now Courtney also reiterated that uh, many journalists, including the members of your network, uh, are often are under attack, uh, digital and physical, and um, are um, uh, targeted by many malicious actors, bo both online and offline. What kind of human resources, we rarely talk about that, what kind of human resources and financial resources uh, journalism organizations or investigative journalism organizations such as yours needs to be able to invest to protect themselves uh, in this context? So um, OCCRP is about 100, 120 people staff, um, depending on how you count, um, and to, to provide information security and help desk uh, for, like, to these people day to day, we have about six, six and a half people dedicated full time to just that, to information security, to help desk, to technical support. But most of this is related to information security, right? Because fixing a printer, this, this takes very short amount of time, usually just restart it, right? But fixing a situation where you have to talk to a source in, a, uh, in an oppressive regime in a way that the source will not get killed um, is, is a little bit more complicated, right? And this requires a lot of thought and this requires a lot of expertise. And 
so, so this, is, this is a substantial part of our budget, right? This is a substantial part of our budget. And to put it in perspective, uh, a, a, an engineer, a programmer at Google will, will be able to make about $30,000 per month. Uh, a programmer at an organization like OCCRP will not make this in a year very often. Right, this is, this is the level of, of lack of funding that we're talking about, right? And there are people, there's a lot of people who want to work for NGOs or for media organizations and do this kind of work, even though they know that they could go to any other large organization, any other large company and make many, many times more. Um, and, and I am one of them and I am grateful to all of my colleagues who are also uh, like that. But this is, this is insane. This is what I'm going to say. This is insane. This is uns unsustainable on the most basic level. And one, while we are talking about sustainability, again, a little bit, a few numbers, right? So uh, Washington Post estimated the U.S. black budget, so NSA, CIA, all those nice little three-letter agencies, at $52 billion in 2013, right, six years ago. The NSA, uh, NSA National Security Agency budget is estimated by Washington Post at 10, uh, well, almost $11 billion. These are, this, this is the money that is spent directly at figuring out ways to attack people, right? There are programmers, there are, there are techies sitting there finding holes in software, and then instead of saying, telling vendors, hey, fix this and keep everyone safe, they hoard it and then build attack tools to attack journalists and attack, attack um, people when they, when they want to, when they need to, right? To compare this with $93 million um, of US CERT, so US uh, Computer Emergency Response Team, so the, the uh, organization in the US that is responsible for protecting everyone, right? This is several l orders of magnitude less money for that, right? Um, so, so this brings us to the next question yeah. of what policy changes you think are needed to happen from the investigative journalism perspective and from the security perspective? So one thing I would say immediately is funding has to be, it doesn't have to go, the funding doesn't immediately have to go into journalism, into tech in journalism, right? It is important to bring more funding for tech in journalism and I would be very interested in that obviously. Um, but giving, giving the funding to NGOs or media organizations to, to fix all those problems in the toxic tech uh, environment that we live in, because this is a toxic tech en en env environment, is like saying, hey, you know what, our roads are death traps, but here's some money so you can buy a better car. This is not the way to fix it, right? The first, the first thing to do is to fix the broader environment, and that means redirecting the money that go into organizations like NSA or CIA to build those tools that are used to attack journalists. And I'm going to use an, give an example of, of the, this exactly happening. Um, redirect this to defense. Redirect this to organizations like US CERT. Redirect this to organizations like Access Now, who has a um, uh, you know, helpline, tech helpline, who, which is an immensely useful resource, right? Why are we building the attack tools and then, and then trying to defend from the tools that we've built, right? And the example I'm going to use is uh, Jamal uh, Khashoggi, right? This, this, uh, this man was killed. Um, probably uh, the, the attackers knew where, when he will be in, in, uh, available for, for this thing um, because he was communicating uh, via a secure tool with, with his friend, but his friend's phone was, um, was compromised by Pegasus, right, which is malware built by NSO Group, an Israeli company, right? There is no way that I can defend people from this kind of access because the amount of money that NSO Group has to create those tools is nowhere near. It's orders of magnitude more than I have to defend from those tools. And this has to happen systematically. Like this, this has to be a systemic change. Thank Can you I, very much for, for your contributions. Um, yes. Can I just okay. want to make two points, like how this is related directly to internet governance, because it's not only about funding, yes. but it's also about the designs of the platform. So if you're designing platforms, for example, that do not have built-in encryption or do not have strong privacy protections, I mean, these are governance issues. Second, you have things like the GIF CT being set up, where it's going to be providing expertise from civil society and governments to 
uh, the you know the most powerful and richest tech companies in the world. Just to say that what is GF, going. Uh, the GIF CT is the yes. global internet forum for counterterrorism, um, and it's going to be seeking foundation right. funding. So then, news organizations and journalist protection organizations are going to be competing to subsidize um, from foundations the richest companies in the world. So that's kind of problematic as well. We, and, and the, I'm sorry, just one more thing, and, and the whole discussion on backdooring encryption because of quote-unquote terrorism, right? This is a huge problem for journalists. We, we, have the, we have some tools that are quite secure, even though, in, even though they have to act like they have to work in this toxic tech environment, and then we hear policymakers making, um, you know, proposals like, hey, let's backdoor these tools, let's break even them, even this little slither of hope, let's take this away, right? Yeah, or let's moderate all the content and create all these barriers to actually getting journalistic content out there, and not to mention online harassment. We have also heard, uh, thank you very much, Matrisha and Courtney for your intervention. Uh, we, we have also heard uh, an interesting presentation uh, from a gentleman from the NATO Stratcom uh, Center of Excellence. Uh, they've done uh, a thorough research on black markets uh, for likes, shares, and uh, followers. And uh, this has created uh, a complete economic uh, uh, space and a big business for malicious uh, actors online. And there is an estimate that uh, uh, only digital advertising fraud at the moment is uh, taking around 10 to $15 billion annually. Uh, we can compare that with the overall uh, revenue that the whole journalism and media sector earns from digital, and that's around $10 billion. So if, uh, if you're looking at potential business models uh, being uh, a part of this uh, uh, malicious uh, uh, farming uh, content, uh, uh, people who don't produce any original content but just uh, uh, buy likes and clicks uh, and uh, use bots, uh, that's probably much more profitable than, than being a journalist. Um, yes, Mark. Yeah, I just wanted, this is Mark Nelson from the Center for International Media Assistance, and I just wanted to bring this back around to some of the the issues that were raised by Hussein at the beginning, I think they were very provocative and important topics that uh, need to be taken into account as, as we go forward, because one of the reasons we created this DC was to try to rebalance a little bit the, the extent to which the internet has been shaped by the trends that you described in your talk. Bec you know, and when, four, three or four years ago, when I first came to my first I, you know, IGF, I was appalled by the lack of media practitioners and the engagement of the media sector in this, in this work. The media, the internet and the, and the governance of the internet has not been shaped by people who care about the public interest or the fairness and treatment of, of pluralism and the um, uh, sustaining truth and, the, uh, and accuracy and, and providing the information that society needs in order to govern itself. And we need to get involved in this to do that. This is the reason we are here, and it's absolutely important for us to keep those things in mind because it's absolutely true that those trends you described are where we're going. But we, as we, you know, in the 1930s, the U.S., in the U.S. context, we had a, a terrible problem with the same kind of journalism that has been taking over lately, yellow journalism that was not involved at all in trying to provide truthful information. And there was a regulatory response that created the Fairness Doctrine and other uh, regulatory responses that uh, for many years ensured a relatively uh, balanced news environment and created a space for news and information in our society. We need to come back to some of those things and think of it for a new era in the digital era with some of the same kinds of values that, uh, that characterize our field. Thank you, Mark, uh, for that intervention. Uh, uh, I think that's uh, one of the questions that we have for Shang Hong Hu from UNESCO, our colleague uh, who we already cooperate with intensively uh, within other UN processes and mechanisms. But this is uh, our first participation formally within the IGF community. And uh, to follow up on, on uh, Mark's comments, 
uh, what is it that we as a community can bring to this uh, uh, policy making uh, space uh, to impact and bring new approaches to regulation and what is the role especially of intergovernmental bodies uh, such as UNESCO uh, in, uh, in these processes and why do you see that it is important that we provide input? Uh, thank you so much. Um, first, may I start by congratulating the success of creation of dynamic coalition. It's really deserve a um, applaud for this. Um, <laughs> Why is that? And you are a poor market. You have been a poor in the past three and four years. I have been shocked for the past 15 years since my first participation in the IGF in Athens, in Greece, 2006. And also, UNESCO has been the facilitator of the WSIS World Summit of Information Society, Action Line C9 Media, which aimed to uh, promote media and journalism to to continue to be instrument in building information societies and knowledge societies. But we had uh, encountered difficult to bring in journalism and media to this forum, to this international community, to these debates. That's why in the, past, in the recent years, we have seen such a growing voices from the journalism, from media, to shape these debates on the internet governance policy. That is extremely important, both for journalism, sustainability and also for the sustainability of uh, internet governance because internet may also be dying without uh, journalism. And that's one point. And then you also asked me about the UNESCO's role. Um, we have been working based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We set out clearly 30 articles of fundamental freedoms, including one of Article 19, which is the dearest mandate to UNESCO. For that purpose, we need to support a free, independent, plural media worldwide. So that's why we have been engaging with journalists and the media for years at several layers. One is to uh, an at the in standard setting and the international cooperation, we are uh, promoting these international standards to apply them to national regulatory and legal frameworks. Because for journalism to sustain, to survive, to thrive in digital age, you need a conducive national legal and regulatory framework to enable you to perform your function freely. And uh, secondly, we are also supporting capacity building and sharing good practices. Um, you have been talking a lot about the funding advertisements. I have another aspect is that uh, and journalism and the media are by nature public interested. They need to have they should be treated like a public good. That's why the public service media has been one of a good practice, although it's originated from Europe. We've been duplicating this good practice worldwide. I mean, every democracy, every country, if you want to have a, a strengthened democracy, to have watchdog, to have a, a development to be sustained, you need to have this public service media and a public interest newspaper as well. So that one, that wouldn't be, uh, we need to have a balance between this public interest and also the advertisement income. Um, that's the second uh, layer we are, working, we are working on. Maybe I should uh, stop here or you want me to? We'll come back to, to, okay. to, to you and uh, other speakers. I think it's time to open the floor to questions. Uh, uh, please introduce yourself and, uh, and also keep uh, questions and comments brief so that we hear uh, hopefully from many people. Uh, thank you very much, Mira. Uh, I am A. S. M. Bozlur Rahman, Chief Executive Officer, Bangladesh NGOs Network for Radio and Communication. We are the proud member of ZFMD from Bangladesh. Uh, media development community was missing in the process of internet governance from, from the beginning, year of the 2006. So therefore, I would like to congratulate, like you, uh, to ZFMD and SEMA, Center for International Media Development, for connecting with IGF process very recent. Uh, very honored to participate here to DC on sustainability of journalism and news media. 
and I am pleased to introduce uh, uh, His Excellency Mr. Hassan Ullah Inu, MP, Member of Parliament and Chairman, Honorable Chairman, uh, Parliamentary Standing Committee for Ministry Information of Bangladesh Parliament uh, and Chair of the Bangladesh IGF. First of all, uh, all of we know, media, entertainment and information sector has been radically disrupted over the last couple of years through introduction, uh, through introduction of the internet, social media, and user-generated content, video streaming, like uh, speakers uh, talking before, uh, and various other technological uh, breakthrough in South Asia, along with Bangladesh. Lots of journalists uh, in Bangladesh loses their job, very recent, uh, from the TV and electronic media, and as well as print media. Business model have been collapses and entire media industry in South Asia have been transformed on disappear completely. Uh, what remains is a weakened media ecosystem vulnerable to failure and abuses. My question is, uh, how DC on sustainability of journalism and news media will contribute to address these challenges? Thank you. Thank you very much, Baslam. Uh, we'll ask Courtney to respond to that question later. Uh, shall we take uh, two more comments and questions, please? Yes. Horst Remus, Cordeta, Germany. Um, I just have a little bit critical question, maybe, about the, the uh, term uh, public good of journalism and media. I have the impression, on the contrary, that is a private good that is meant for the public, but it's not owned by the public as a, as a public good. So that is a criticism. The, the question is, uh, who is, besides the journalists, promoters that are sitting here, who else is in the position, parliamentarians, TV people, mass media, or special media people that really organize these problems in their prime time because it's their profession. So uh, that is what I say, what is the proposal it's to put these problems that we are discussing here in small circle, to put these problems in a real open, politically active discussion. And I have the impression that, uh, this is my personal opinion, I appreciate that we have that discussion here at IGF. Nevertheless, I have the impression that it would be even more effective to have that discussion at the WISIS in, in Geneva next year. So please organize early for having not just a backyard side event, but make that together with uh, renowned journalists and media stations independent better than the others, uh, to, to make that a real key event in Geneva. Thank you very much. So, uh, I, I missed it. Uh, have you introduced yourself? Yes, I did. Uh, Horst Kramer is Codeda, Germany. I'm an information scientist. I'm not a journalist, but Thank I'm uh, involved for information society. That's absolutely fine. You have every right to comment on journalism. Um, any other? Yes, we have uh, one question from the bottom of the floor. Hello, everyone. I am Margaret Lopez. I am a journalist from Venezuela. I am a fellow for the Open Internet Leaders for Democracy program. And I want to know, especially for Hussein, um, what do you think that uh, journalists need to take actions about this problem of the journalist increase in crisis? Um, because probably usually we think to link uh, the journalist crisis only to the news media. But uh, um, what is the role of the journalists? What do they think that can be? What is the actions and what is the, the, the new ways to think and that I need to, to prove? Thank you very much. Uh, shall we start with Hussein and then, and then Courtney and then uh, Shimon? Yeah, thanks. That's a very good question. Um, I would say, obviously, this is more of a structural um, crisis rather than an individual because there are many creative, smart journalists who could be doing other things that could be much, much more appealing to the public if the infrastructure is, is prepared for them. Um, 
I mean, obviously, the, the, the crisis has led into the fact that many people leave journalism, many really smart people leave the area of the profession of journalism very early on, as soon as they, they start, you know, as soon as they create some sort of successful work resume, in a way, so they would go to other sectors. You end up with very young people who are doing journalism in most parts of the world. This is increasingly the case because you know people who would still be living with their parents can do journalism because it's become impossible to even pay a decent, moderate rent as a journalist. Um, so the structures should change. And I'm, my proposal, which seems radical for journalists now, but if you actually if you leave the prejudice aside and see what is working now, and when you realize that the things that are working are the documentaries, are you know, the daily podcast of the, of the New York Times, for example, um, of many similar examples, then you would have to accept the reality that, I mean, I personally was very against this trend of um, you know, leaving or departing from the reason-based sort of communication in a way, if we can vaguely call it, to, towards a very emotional, affect-based kind of narratives. And news used to be a very um, reason-based kind of narrative. A fact, I mean, it still has to be fact-based, otherwise it wouldn't be journalism, even if it's effective. But the effective narratives are what, has, what is popular, what is what is selling, um, what is economically viable. So my proposal is structural and about the production and the, the product, the output of journalism. So anybody who is doing anything, if it's up to you how you want to represent it, if you make a documentary based on that, or even if you make a podcast which is much cheaper than a video documentary with, this, with a dramatic structure, it would be much more widely seen and, and heard and available. So it's, at, at the end of the day, it's a structural thing. And unfortunately, individuals can't do much. So that's, that's one, one side uh, of the coin in terms of what are you able to do in the current uh, existing framework and existing uh, moderation and uh, existing incentive structure within the platform ecosystem. But what we as the DC, uh, to get back to, uh, to the question from Bangladesh, what uh, we as the dynamic coalition and this multi-stakeholder process can do and would like to do, uh, Courtney, we had a good uh, meeting uh, on Monday uh, during the day zero and we were discussing what would be some research uh, questions, what would be some, some of the po uh, policy avenues. Uh, what's your take on what the role of the uh, dynamic coalitions and especially this new one is? Thank you. Um, I think part of the role of this dynamic coalition is to um, figure out how these structural issues, both that Hussein raised, but also that are brought up by um, other developments that may appear to have nothing to do with this um, issue, actually have profound implications on journalism and the sustainability of news media, and by extension, democracy and governance by citizens. Um, to that end, for example, if we're talking about sustainability, you know, part of the implications in what Hussein was saying is the ability to entertain, to reach the large audience. That's because the incentives built into the platforms and the importance of, of data in fueling this, um, that is a structural choice. That's a choice about how we're choosing to govern the internet. So let's interrogate that choice because not all journalism is this amazingly important investigative journalism or um, designed to you know, entertain or tell long stories. It's very hard for local journalism just to report on that boring meeting at the school board. Or um, you know, in Venezuela, for example, issues around internet shutdowns, around censorship. Um, ha have profound implications. And so I think bringing in these issues into the dynamic coalition, one thing we discussed doing for you know, the first year is thinking about pulling out some of these key internet governance issues and then elucidating what are the dimensions that have an impact on the sustainability of journalism in the news media so that we can then create a plan of work. 
uh, we also had some ideas about what research is needed and what, uh, what kind of insights are needed to make uh, what we would call evidence-based policy. But Richard had a comment. Yes, one, uh, two very short comments. This this uh, news um, news flash about the boring meeting at a school board or anything like that. This is what investigative journalists use to prove their stories. This is the. On, on some on some weird site somewhere at the back, you know, of the back the end of the internet, right? You find this little story that proves that a person met a person at this weird meeting, or or that something like the, something changed hands or anything like that. So it's not about how important something is because we wouldn't be able to do our job as investigative journalists without those local journalists doing their job day in, day out, and publishing, publishing stories. And second comment is that that's great. We did all, this, all of this. We did this three-year investigation. We publish it, and then we cannot reach our reader base because Facebook is testing news feed in Serbia, and our member center happens to be based in Serbia, right? And they, like, day to day, they lost 40% of their readership because Facebook made a technical decision. And as you said, these are, these are structural d d decisions that we have to interrogate. Th these, are, these are things we have to think about, and that's why this is relevant to the, to the, to the IGF very much. Thank you. Uh, we had a question about uh, journalism as, as public good. Shen Kong, you, you mentioned already um, some experiences and best practices in terms of public service broadcasting and the model that started in Europe. Uh, what are the current ideas uh, around uh, uh, public, service, uh, um, public service content journalism funding in the digital sphere? And then Hussein had, I think, the same idea as well. Yeah, I, I like to talk more about this subject because um, in this Internet Governance Forum, also I heard a lot of discussion about uh, how to make the Internet uh, in public service, public interested. I think uh, there's still a lack of awareness among the member states and also at the also international uh, community to know the significance of journalism, what it means for the international community, because uh, what is the public good now? I think the biggest public good it is the uh, sustainable development goals. I mean, the, that uh, now the global consensus about uh, what we human society want to achieve by 2030. You look at the 17 SDGs, how you er eradicate poverty, how you fight for achieve gender equality, how you uh, combat climate change, how you uh, achieve education for all. Every goals, and also the SDG number 16, the uh, first time it recognized um, the role of universal access to information mm -hmm. and uh, justice. I mean, but the journalism's role was not so clearly highlighted in this SDG uh, plan and also targets. But uh, UNESCO and many uh, organizations we do recognize without uh, professional journalism, no single goal of SDG will be ever achieved. That's why I think the global leaders, and, I mean the WISIS community and IGF, they should really recognize that journalism, it is a key stakeholder it is not just um, among civil society, among academics. No, journalism, it is a stakeholder, a very distinct, uh, important stakeholder. Journalism media should be a contributor to shape the internet and also the society. That's why in our um, research policy uh, recommendation, we always identify what, the, what should the role of the journalist to be. For example, this morning we, um, launch a new uh, publication about uh, steering artificial intelligence for knowledge societies. And we said, uh, what are the big challenges of internet, uh, cyberspace? Uh, it's being fragmented, it's being, it's be, now it's become a, it's called a goldfish bowl, uh, I mean, shaped by this social media platform. We are, it's like we are living in a transparent, we are all goldfish, we, we feel we are, we see the world, but it's being shaped, it's being by the platform. So we have lost, I mean, the, uh, the artificial intelligence media, I mean, social media, they are not only creating, disseminating fake news, but they are creating a fake world to us. That's how I see the crucial role of journalism. We need the journalist to be a response, to be a solution. Don't just talk about oh, journalists dying. No, you should not die. You should really survive to, to revive as a solution to, to solve this problem because the public has been, has been, has lost the, the, this 
classic feeling to read a newspaper, to look at the public service media, like my children, generation, they are braised, and the, the only thing they see is the social media. That's why we need that, that alternative. I think there are many opportunities. Um, we should not be so pessimistic. That's why the multi-stakeholder approach is important. I think the journalism media should stop being silos. I mean, yes, you are independent, but you should really work more with other stakeholders. I have heard that some initiative like, uh, like it's like a public space, it's a coalition of the uh, uh, digital alternative to public service media, and also there are many uh, public media in Netherlands, in the UK, in the Europe, they are going digital to capture the young audiences. They're, and even artificial intelligence, it can be really used by our journalists first to strengthen our investigation, verification before, them, and rather than to, to do something on the contrary. So I do see the a lot of opportunities for journalism to, to be a king of the of our digital era. Thank you. That's a, a, a big question for digital policy. If uh, journalism is treated as a public good, and if the market is failing to provide conditions for this public good to exist, uh, what are the policies and regulations that enable states to provide for this uh, uh, gap that market has created? So Hussein, what's your take on this? Um, yeah, let's actually step back a little bit and see what platforms are, because I think this would enlighten the whole debate about how to regulate them. The brilliant aspect or innovation that the platforms um, were and are comes from the fact that they organize relations, not objects. They distribute relations, not objects. So when it comes to Uber, none of the platforms obviously own anything, so they don't distribute any of these things. They distribute the relations and the organized relations. So when it comes to news, what they do, like Facebook, is they distribute, they basically, they organize the relation between users, publishers, or that could be users themselves, um, and advertisers. But they don't own any of these things. They keep some of them on the servers for some time, but they don't really own any of that material. That's why, legally, it's a challenge to regulate them because they, there is no framework, maybe, for regulating relations. So that's, that's an important... And then, can I, can I continue? So then I want to con connect this to the idea of what we should do with these platforms um, from two aspects. When it comes to news, um, obviously this is not a very original proposal, but I think it's time for um, Europe at least, because they are the most caring about this idea of private, especially from another part of the world. American platforms with American values dominating the world, including Europe. So why not creating their own platform using the infrastructure that exists in public service media already, some of them could join forces and create a publicly governed and publicly funded platform just for the news in the beginning and then they would be able to ask other people to join them as well from Canada, from other public broadcasters and newspapers and magazines that would want to join. And this way, they could govern the algorithms, which is the most important aspect. And I have something else about the algorithms that I'll tell you maybe after you if you have time. Courtney. Well, I just realized that I don't know if we responded adequately to two points of the question. So one aspect from our colleague from Nepal is by creating a dynamic coalition like this, there is a very clear entry point for um, local organizations from around the world and in different countries um, that work on these issues to engage with a very complicated process and a very complicated organization that can take a lot of resources. So that's one way we help this. We hope this will really help um, local organizations like yours. Um, okay. and it, Maybe yeah. it's uh, the time to uh, to say in what ways they can engage with the Dynamic Coalition. Yeah, so there's a mailing list. You can definitely sign up. Mm -hmm. um, my, Michael can put you, if you raise your hand, he can put you on the mailing list. Um, and we are in the process of, um, we've just put out a charter and in the process of defining the research agenda. So there's, it's a great opportunity 
time to get involved. And then the second thing, somebody asked about what other fora and what other you know, like legislators and parliamentarians can do. So I would take this opportunity because I see the government of Canada in the room, and I'm sure other governments are here, you know, that they have these efforts around defending media freedom. And so thinking about where does internet governance fit on that agenda, I think that's also a way we can do this. And we would welcome the ability to get onto the agenda of other important venues. As I mentioned in 2014, we did a session on press freedom as an internet governance issue, but the MAG never accepted the proposals in the interim years until now to create the dynamic coalition. So at least now we get a set time. But part of it is to see that there is a need and an interest in this issue so that when we try to get on the agenda of these other venues, they'll accept our proposals or they'll be proactive in putting that um, on the agenda. Thank you, that's a, that's a very good point. And uh, uh, as you know, dynamic coalitions are open and supposed to be multi-stakeholder uh, groups. Uh, so we are inviting all of you, uh, if you're interested, to join the mailing list. It's on the page of Internet Governance uh, uh, Forum where dynamic coalitions are. Uh, uh, or you can get in touch with Michael. And also please uh, uh, feel uh, free to participate and suggest uh, research agenda or participation in events that you think are important. We think, uh, I think we have uh, another 10 minutes for, for questions, uh, but just uh, make them uh, uh, quick and uh, we'll also give some uh, brief final remarks. We have Two questions there. Laura, I think you, uh, there is a, a mic here. Hi, hi. Um, I'm Laura Moore from Deutsche Welle Academy. Um, and I think Courtney, you just raised that issue. Um, being here at this multi-stakeholder um, meeting, I would like, we, you know, we co congratulated this um, inauguration of the, the um, dynamic coalition and the launch, and I think this is now the moment to maybe express the wish to take this seriously, that it's a multi-stakeholder, um, and also multi kind of regional and context platform, because we talk about the sustainability of news media, and I think, you know, as, as media development organizations who have worked on this topic, we know that there's very few topics such as sustainability that very, very much depend on the national context and the actual environments where this is taking place. So we often think that we know um, what we talk about when we talk about sustainability or viability of news. But here I think it is particularly important to take into account the national context and the actors that are on the ground and know what they're talking about and the, the you know, everyday life that journalists are um, working in. So I would hope for this dynamic coalition to make this also really a platform from all the voices from all over the world and also um, from women, because that's my first IGF, but and I've, I've been quite shocked uh, in some panels by the uh, number of women included. Thank you, yes, this panel, yeah. Uh, thank you, Laura, and uh, uh, this is a great opportunity to say that uh, uh, we have uh, worked closely with a couple of organizations. Uh, Center for International Media Assistance was mentioned. Deutsche Welle Academy was also critical in, in this work. Uh, uh, Wanifra, that represents uh, a private uh, media sector, also uh, committed to protect journalists, and we had uh, uh, a huge support uh, from UNESCO and, uh, and uh, other partners uh, uh, that uh, uh, we work uh, with on uh, on daily basis. Um, uh, the special aspect of, of that cooperation, yes, I know we have two more questions, is that all these organizations bring uh, um, information about what is the state of uh, journalism and media sustainability in different countries around the world. So that's one of the issues that we will try to address, is to bring more uh, voices from what we call Global South and more diverse voices and information about what are the priority issues for, for them. Um, we have a question there. Yes, please. I think it now, yeah? My name is Prabhupada Subedi. I'm a journalist from Nepal. And what I think is, it is too early to 
make the global generalized concept on these issues because we have to explore uh, from so micro community level because the impact of internet and uh, practices of journalism in new platform are so diverse, so dynamic. And I'd like to share our experience from Nepal uh, is uh, one uh, for friends here, the, my neighbor from Bangladesh explained. It's just 100 kilometers away from his country and we have totally different story. Uh, new media, internet-based media has raised more than 200% salary of journalists in my country because before traditional media houses uh, were well known for paying uh, low salaries and now journalists have many opportunities and they, they can, they ha and, uh, they can live any, any time, any houses. So the, it putting pressure for big media organization to raise their salaries. And otherwise, uh, it giving more chances for local languages and kind of, you know, the, uh, syndication, traditional syndication has broken. So, uh, from our experience, uh, there is uh, there are not only challenges. Uh, only the traditional conservative media houses has that sort of outcry. There is no future of journalism. But from uh, the audience aspect, people have more diverse content, uh, content, uh, more choices. So. Uh, I don't, uh, I don't think we, we just can build up the single ready me and apply worldwide. Thank you. Thank you very much for that comment. That was uh, um, absolutely true. And uh, uh, we've seen over the, the last 10 years that there is no single silver bullet that will uh, resolve the disruption of the business model. Uh, we are looking at uh, some potential models and for some uh, journalism organizations, uh, membership model will work. For some, uh, some forms of advertising will work, such as uh, native advertising that's uh, um, ethical. Uh, for some, uh, um, uh, philanthropy and uh, donor support will work. Uh, so those are all the aspects uh, that uh, uh, do exist, uh, but we do believe that there is a need for affirmative uh, policy action and uh, in some cases regulation, especially regulation of digital marketplaces that will provide for uh, free and open market of ideas that will provide space for new entrants who will provide maybe better services uh, uh, to citizens and better space for journalists to provide information. So that's one of the areas where we think there is intersection between different stakeholder communities here in the Internet Governance Forum. We also believe that there is a, a, a large discussion to be had around uh, uh, digital advertising, including political advertising where our community, of course, has, has a lot to say. Um, and other uh, policy discussions uh, that we would like to hear about from you, especially when they relate to local level, uh, such as uh, uh, content takedown procedures and respecting uh, um, obligations of uh, uh, private companies to respect notice, appeal, and, and remedy procedure, which is not the case at the moment with, uh, with many of the, of the platforms. Um, Yes, Courtney. I would just add, you know, this issue around salaries and how, um, you know, the, the economic incentives that are built in, um, given the platforms that and the internet and the centrality of to journalism means that newsrooms have to decide whether they're going to hire uh, social media experts or technical experts. Um, they're also at the mercy of decisions around algorithmic changes when Facebook experiments with putting out a new news feed or um, changes the way that it makes certain things visible or not. You know, they tested it out, for example, um, in 2018, I believe they tested on Facebook uh, some sort of shift in the algorithm that had a huge impact in the 11 countries, several of which were in Southeast Asia, 
on the news media outlets there. So, you know, again, these, these decisions about how um, these decisions on platforms are made, how they're communicated, um, have real economic impact on the news media and on journalists who have to figure out where to devote resources and how to adapt to those changes, often without advance notice. Similarly, multilingualism is a huge issue for the internet. Um, and right now, obviously, it's very um, dominated by a few major languages, and especially English. And that has a huge ability on the um, access to information issue related to the SDGs um, and the ability of local communities to access information and journalism that is important to their lives. Um, one of the ideas that I've been working on when it comes to regulation is a kind of new approach to, um, to platforms. Because if you, if you assign three layers to platforms, which is one is the, the code or the hard part of the platform, um, then the second part is the algorithms, and then the, the third layer is the data. So these things are not completely separate yet. But if, I mean, data is partly separate sort of now with the new regulations, but nobody has actually detached the algorithms from the platform. And the consequence of this is that they have a monopoly on their own platform. So imagine they would be regulated in, a, in such a way that they would have to allow third party algorithms on their platforms. And imagine how the market mechanisms and the competition would force all these platforms um, to become much more transparent. And look, I mean, think about the market that would be created for businesses that, would, that are only creating algorithms for different platforms. And it's not just you know, Facebook. Think about Google Maps. Think about self-driving cars. Think about Amazon. Imagine you would be able, for example, to choose a third-party algorithm that for your own self-driving car instead of the built-in, by default, um, Tesla car. So uh, nobody's done it yet. Um, there were some at attempts in Italy a few years ago to, uh, when it came to iOS and Apple. It, it was a legislation which was eventually rejected, but it was called um, device neutrality. And I would want to suggest to reframe that as platform neutrality, and this would be one, I would say, a, 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 an angle to, to tackle many of these issues, transparency, maybe many other things that we are all complaining about, but it hasn't been looked at this way. Thank you. Uh, so that's, that's, these are ongoing discussions, right, in the tech community, and this is also the, the question of whether or not those platforms should be required to be uh, to have open protocols and, and talk to each other. Why do we have email servers that talk to each other? My email server talks to your email server and we can send an email across different providers, but, but Twitter users cannot talk to Facebook users, right? It's, it's, it's not rocket surgery, right? It's, it's, it's doable, so why, why don't we have that? Um, and one example I would give about the, the, the algorithms, there's a, there's a social network called Mastodon, um, which is kind of like Twitter, but open and, and decentralized. And every now and then, there's a rush of users from Twitter to Mastodon because Twitter does something stupid. Um, and every time this happens, uh, the new users, the Twitter users, the Twitter, the Twitter refugees, let's call them, uh, are amazed and just, and just love one feature of Mastodon, which is a chronological timeline. Right? Somehow, Twitter's you know, super expensive magical algorithms of how the timeline should look are way worse than just showing all the posts in a chronological order. And, and users were, when, before Twitter came back to this idea that the timeline should be chronological, whenever there were Twitter refugees on Mastodon, everyone was like, wow, the timeline is chronological. The simplest algorithm, uh, algorithm turned out to be the best. So yeah, like this is, uh, this is a, a very important point that we need. We need this algorithm transparency, but also algorithm compatibility and, and neutrality. Thank you very much. Uh, before we wrap up, are there any uh, um, comments or responses to what we've just heard or any uh, last questions? No? Oh, yes, we do. Yes, yeah, go ahead. In the microphone there. 
Yeah? Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness, I'm so short. <laughs> um, it's sizest. <laughs> no, it was a really, really small comment. It's not really worth all of this fuss. But I, I, I was enjoying some of the more encouraging comments that were coming from the different people in the room. And I was wondering if, if one of those simple projects that we could do, maybe as a dynamic coalition, would be to actually collect some of the best practices and things that are working. So. You know, we, we talked about different ways of engaging with art, uh, but also maybe some of these like media uh, uh, that, that doesn't rely on advertising, looking at what is actually working in this space and, and see what we can replicate. So, as I said, a simple point. Yes, thank you very much. And a perfect one for a wrap up because you've heard there are so many issues that touch upon sustainability of journalism and news in digital spaces. And they're very complicated, and we are new to this discussion. Uh, the challenge will be to pick and choose those simple projects, those simple con contributions that will make the biggest impact, and that will make sure that we at least join the discussions that are shaping the future of internet, and that are shaping the future of internet that will have open and democratic public spaces, open for independent and professional journalism and independent and professional uh, media. So please help us do that. Help us address all of these issues strategically and with few resources the organizations that work in this field have, especially if you come from private sector and governmental sector, please join our dynamic coalition and uh, let's work together to address these huge issues that are facing not only journalism and media, but our democracies as well. Thank you very much for staying with us so late. Uh, we hope you will stay in touch. Uh, you have our page on the Internet Governance uh, Forum as a dynamic coalition, and we look forward to seeing you in other conferences, other events, and next year at the Internet Governance Forum. Thank you.